Hello everyone and welcome to another Scots We Hate podcast and I'm joined today by di film director Alistair Cole and we're going to talk about his film Yoram. But hello Alistair. Hello Ali, how? thanks for having me. Oh it's a pleasure and you should say that Yoram's on as part of the Glasgow Film Festival and it's also the first cinema documentary in Scots Gaelic, that's correct isn't it? Yeah, it's sort of, you know, a little bit of an anomaly of the film that it wasn't what we intended to, you know, we didn't set out trying to make the first ever cinema documentary, but um, obviously there's been a lot of documentaries, BBC album make, you know, great great TV work, and uh, but this, due to the nature of it, it sort of, we realised very, uh, after after research and getting told that maybe this is the first, you know, cinematic documentary that's 100% in, in Scots Gaelic, which is, which is wonderful, and it, and it helps us obviously, you know, um, flag up the language which is part of the project but um but also it's an interesting you know an interesting side discussion yeah sure absolutely and Yoram is also in brackets boat song so yeah tell us a little bit about how you describe the film to people yeah I mean like any foreign language film that the, the title is Yoram but the, the English title is boat song the Italian title is Canto di Volga is you know there's there's a title for all of them and and I suppose it's, you know, it's very much a portrait of the Outer Hebrides, but it's told through, you know, this sound archive that was recorded in the 1940s and 50s. Um, it's an extraordinary sound archive, really, of, that was recorded by ethnographers that went up to the islands. Sort of when sound recording devices first became portable, which was, you know, a bit later than cameras in some ways. And yeah. It was the late 40s. And um, a lot of them, most of them are working with the School of Scottish Studies at the University of Edinburgh. And they, you know, they had very different intentions that, uh, about what they, were, what they were recording. They were recording songs and stories and, and the language itself. Um, and so this, this moment in time is really the first time that a language, which has, you know, been spoken for well over a thousand years in the Outer Hebrides, was recorded um, onto tape and onto wire recordings. A lot of the first recordings were wire recordings. And, and the, the film itself is about, you know, linking the fishing community, which underpins the, the islands, the, the kind of industry and the, the sea itself, um, with this, this with the language and the history, because the link is, is, is very much there. It, it stems from this idea that uh, the research that was, that was being done by colleagues at um, the University of Edinburgh around this, the importance of fishing, the fishing industry today to the, the Gaelic language. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, over 75% of inshore fishermen are Gaelic speakers and, you know, they come hand in hand and, and you know, looking after the fishing industry is, is part of looking after the Gaelic language. And as a way to explore that and as a way to kind of, uh, you know, and just link together the past and the present, this film came about and, and it was a, you know, it's a creative documentary in its, in, you know, in its broader sense. It's, it's a creative project. It started from a kind of concept that, and a question that I asked myself a little bit when I was, in the Hebrides doing research and, and you know, being charmed by the, the place and the boats, but also wondering what would happen if you if you made a, a feature doc that was entirely led by a sound archive and everything you heard was archive and everything you saw was was contemporary. Yeah. And what would that do? And you know, it's, it reverses the your idea normally about film where you, yeah. you let, it, it leads, you have your ears lead you in a way, which is an interesting um, sort of creative process to go through. but. It, it was a way purely it started from the you know a way to link these two elements the past and the present but not in a kind of you know didactic way where someone's telling you about the past yeah it's really it kind of throws you a little bit at the beginning as a viewer because yeah. the all it's all the voiceover as you say the archive but there's all there's often a lot of people on screen but they're not talking there's no talking heads for instance no. you know there's not um, uh, even a lot of conversation between people when they're working on the boats or working in the factories or whatever. Uh, so it is, it really kind of flips your idea of what a film is going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, and that was part of it. That was, that was an, like, we'd explored that with the editing about how that works. We had to set the start up in a way that would, would link you to that. You know, there's some amazing sound archive that we found that almost was the archive that made me realise the film could happen. And we put it near the start of the film, but it was, you know, a conversation recorded in the very early 50s of um, some guys in the islands discussing the sound recorder itself and being like, what does this do? You know, like, does this, this captures the sound? This is sort of incredible. And when you realize that it was, you know, they were reflecting on that and you put that against images, you could kind of lay this out, what was going on for an audience without telling them. I mean, we didn't really want to, 
put text to the front and say this is what's going on we want an audience to kind of go through that a little bit of confusion and ambiguity maybe at the start but that's part of cinema and, and it was very much cut for a cinema but we think it works very well on on you know home cinemas um and which is where it is right now you know there's very little choice in that but um but it is it has been a really interesting thing to see audiences responses we we had test audiences and and seeing what they where they understood and how and also for non-scottish audiences because then you also have an interesting position where you have gaelic speaking audiences they understand a whole they have a whole other level of understanding of it because they yeah. understand the yeah. archive and then you have you know scots audiences scottish audiences who understand the context they understand the islands and the, the world there but but not the language so they're watching it with subtitles and then you will have an, an audience that's that's you know really coming to it with with fresh eyes that don't no either and it's yeah. you know it's a far off island off the uk somewhere sort of thing so you you take all them into consideration when we're when we're editing and how they will read the film so you do have to flag things up fairly obviously in the edit but without being you know too too obvious and and, and let people get into it because it is something that we always wanted to make that was immersive that was sort of you would just let this wash over you you could spend this 90 minutes just gradually you know entering into this world of, of both the 50s and, and, and the world today. And hopefully by the end, you know, it, it, it extends into some themes that are much bigger than just a fishing community language. It's, you know, be it clearances and storytelling and, you know, much bigger universal ideas as well, which is, yeah, what we, what we gun for, but it was, it was a very, uh, yeah, interesting process. And the, and the music, we haven't even mentioned the music and we can talk yeah. about that after, but that's, you know, that's fundamental to the film as well. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's quite hypnotic viewing at times because you've got it opens with this fabulous um, image of the jellyfish in the water, mm. and the, and and the natural world is really important as well. Through it, you've got crabs and seals and a lot of things like that going on. Um, and at times, you do you kind of you're watching and you're just you, you, the, what's being said. Almost, I mean, of course, it matters, but you kind of with the music as well, all three work together to have this kind of almost, almost ambient, if that makes sense. No, it is, it, we do want, we wanted to find a way to blend them together. And this was the, the trick with it. So the editor of the film is, is a film editor called Colin Money, who's, you know, one of Scotland's top editors. He, he edited Magdalene Sisters. He worked on some brilliant docs from uh, We and All the Lights and from Scotland with Love and kind of has this really innate ability a, a, around you know, guiding an audience, but also understanding an emotional journey of the audience and that's where we you know we were able to work together really well and 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 to um yeah to have the audience kind of just get lost in this a lot and 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 that was about you know there was thirty thousand clips in that archive it's huge and so i had done years of research and, and that boiled it down but then you know in the final film there's 80 or 90 voices i think there's 70 voices and almost 100 clips um and you know some of them are very short and some of them are just moments and you don't necessarily you, at the end you know you, it, it develops at the end and you find out who's who but at the same time you you kind of we wanted it to be a portrait and to you know even the opening in some ways we wanted the voices to be coming in with the ear with the wind and and, and to to just wash over you in a way and so yeah the i'm glad you mentioned the jellyfish they're, they're some of our favorite things it was a there's a wonderful underwater for cinematographer called lindsey brown that shot them and um and she, you know, some of the other, all the underwater material shot by her and some of the, you know, the shipwreck material and, and things. And, and they were important. We realized visually I shot, you know, 80% of it. I, I filmed myself on the boats and on the islands, but the drone, the drone material and the, and the underwater world were key because like you said, the nature, nature's part of this and, it, and it, it's the fishing. Well, we talk about the fishing industry and the community, the, the stories themselves are often talking about more often than not talking about, you know, the fish themselves and, and mermaids and and, yeah. and selkies and these things, you know, and they're, they're, they're part of that, they're part of the, the culture and the language. So you want to find a way to bring them into the into the world as well, visually. Um, without, you know, we were never trying to illustrate what was going on in the story. We were trying to bring people into the world, like you said, and, and just let you get, drift into the, uh, into the world of the jellyfish. Because there are things which are being said, and you know, now that you've explained it, you know that the voices are from a while ago. But when you see the images, you think this could still be related today. I think there's one point where you say about the grumpy skipper who says, 
you know, no whistling on my boat, which, you know, is supposed yeah. to be bad luck if I don't know it right. And you thought, well, and then, but it's during footage of people working the boats. You think, well, this, this is connected because these stories could still be told, including the ones about the fairies and, and you know, and all of that stuff as well. Yeah, and it's interesting because it was a matter of playing on people's, you know, expectations of what they normally see and hear. And, yeah. and you do, you're right, it's very strange in a film to almost see other people on screen and hear totally disconnected, what you, would appear to be disconnected voices, but it, but that was part of it, to understand that actually they're not disconnected, and, and those fishermen today are, are fishing waters that have this thousand year history that is connected through language and story, and that they, you know, they're tied, they're, they're, they're quite, you know, t tied to these to this history. And, you know, the, the, it's a good example that the story of Grumpy Kenny, we called him, Grumpy Kenny was the, was the skipper that was in the archive. And it was a brilliant story about, you know, a guy talking about his his skipper that was, um, that they would sort of tease and, and pull the yeah. leg off because he was so grumpy. But, you know, we I was filming on cruise, you know, they weren't grumpy skippers necessarily, but they were, you know, they were great guys from the islands and they they were weathered, weathered fishermen. <laughs> they definitely wouldn't put up with too much nonsense on board. And you're not saying it's them or anything, but it represents that that connection that we wanted to make between the past and the present, um, because it it goes you know it goes beyond the individual. It's a, it's a it's yeah you know, it's quite uh, you know intangible and, and important as well. Uh, there's a, a lovely bit where um, someone says they used to when we used to fish, we used to fish the big herring. As if, and they're no longer around. I love this idea of this guy going, "Yeah, back in my day, <laughs> <They're> that size." <laughs> totally. Yeah, there was a there was a lot of that. I mean, they were. It was interesting because the time frames were were quite notable. That you were talking, they were recording in the forties and fifties, and you often had to kind of do the maths in your head a little bit in the edit. We had sort of timelines and big maps of the place to look at, and you had a, you know, they were talking about a time in the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s. So a lot of the, the, the folk that were recorded were, you know, well into their 70s and 80s and the yeah. 40s. And, the, and to be honest, there was, there has been a change, you know, the, the, the hearing run stopped. It was yeah. still going full noise then. And they talked about, you know, they would talk about, there's a lot of material from the hearing uh, times. And they would talk about in Castle Bay and Butter, there was, you could walk from boat to boat. You know, there was so many boats yeah. that you just step from one to the other. And they would come up as a fleet and they would, you know, there was there's a, there's a story of there being something like a thousand boats on the water at times in some of these locks, and of course it, it got really fished. And yeah. one of the, the ironies is when you're it's a film about fishing, but you really don't see a lot of fish in the present day, no. because you know the herring of today are, are prawns. Really, mm -hmm. that's what's going on. That's uh, all the all lobsters and crabs, and that's the majority of what's getting taken these days. But um, it it, it changes, it evolves. I think the, they the, the fishermen are the biggest environmental, the inshore guys are easily the biggest environmentalists I met in the whole project. They understand the sea, they know it very well and they fight, you know, they fight tooth and nail for that sea, the, the inshore yeah. guys. It's not, it, it's very much, you know, they are, you know, they get wrapped in the same, often by people, they get wrapped in the same cloak as the kind of super tanker type fishing. That's not what's going on there, you know, it's 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 a very different world. So, um, yeah, the, the, that history and that hundred years of, of fishing is, Changed, it's evolved, the amount of fish, the type of fish. Even while I was up there, even while I was up there, I was filming for three years and suddenly octopus arrived in the in the water, you know, and they were pulling them up and they didn't this first year they weren't totally sure they didn't have a market for them. Second year they got some Spanish buyers and they were pulling them in That's and selling really them. Wow. And it can change so things, quickly. So things change. Yeah. And, and that was one of the things that was striking to me as well was it's quite rare these days, I think, to see hard manual labor on film it's kind of from the past you think about shipbuilding or mining and these are all either sepia or black and white pictures but here you see these guys you know and it's a hard hard life and a dangerous one as as the film shows as well yeah that was actually that's it's great you point that out because it is you know it is fundamentally a dangerous profession um especially on the trawlers you know like they it's and it's tough work it's i think that the, the creole fishing has a has a certain lifestyle to it, like it's a bit more nine to five. Um, and a lot of the island guys that are working on that, they work so hard, you know, and through the winter, I was, they will still go out in the winter, they, or they'll be repairing creels all yeah. winter, you know, like I, I, I filmed with them repairing on land in January and, you know, they, they were on creel number thousand and something, fixing it, you know, just physically working. And it's, you no, know, but I think the, 
the love that they have for the sea, a lot of these guys, when they'll, they'll tell you, I'll be there looking at the gannets, you know, diving in there or the, the sunrise over the minch, and there is a real passion that comes with it. So I think that the, for them, a lot of them, the sea is, is their home, and, and it's, it's a beautiful, that they see the beauty in it as well. But you're absolutely right. The toughness of the manual labor also drives, it means it's hard for them to get crew, a lot of the bigger boats. Yeah. It's hard for them to um, get local workers to come on board because, like you said, there's other options. Um, so that's it, you know, that, that the economics of it, we, we hint at within certain material and we, we also highlight within the sound archive, it was the, 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 the stress around jobs was there 60, 70 years ago and yeah. it's a great, you know, there's a great story of a guy trying to, you know, he didn't get a job as a lighthouse keeper and because there wasn't much else and, and you have that, that this, the fact that some things hadn't, haven't changed is, is also a bit tough to hear because it's been a long time since these things were recorded and some things haven't improved when, you know, they really should have. And I should say about the safety, actually, the safety was an interesting thing because that's also where we, the, the, the lifeboats and the coast guards came into it for a yeah. few reasons. We, they, you know, they're part of the community. When we were looking at this, you, you also realized there's so many stories of tragedy. I mean, just, just terrible tragedies that would wipe out community, wipe out islands. Mingule, Mingule actually, or Pabe is an island, had to get, they, they left Pabe because of one accident. Mm -hmm. you know, Pabe was, people, they, they, they moved, that basically got cleared, um, uh, people left there, sorry, uh, after a big accident, four of their men died in an accident, and that was it, you know, and, and that was the sort of level of tragedy that you, that could, you know, hit a town or village, but then you see the lifeboats today, and I, you know, I got to film in the engine room with these lifeboats, they're like four wheeler one cars, they're just incredible, like, they're yeah. the most advanced boat I've ever seen, and they, of course they have to be, and, and they, it's an interesting mix, because the boats, are so technologically advanced to be able to plow through big seas and save people. But actually the most important thing they had often with the coxswains that spoke Gaelic, because if there was a fisherman that was, that was, um, there was a Gaelic speaker that had got to trouble for him, it was far, far quicker to be able to explain location, what was going on in Gaelic, because the islands are, have Gaelic names, the places, the bays, the, everything's in Gaelic really for them to communicate. So they always said that their coxswains were Gaelic speakers for that and butter, which was really fascinating, but it, highlighted you know the advances that have been made so there is there was it there you know it is dangerous still but compared to 50 years ago and then 100 years ago when they were talking about it, it's it's made huge advances and, and that that control center in stornoway that looks after everything um that we filmed at as well was is an amazing place and a, and a really important kind of savior for a lot of those guys that things happen in the sea that you just it's unavoidable in those oceans but they can definitely get out to, to help them quick I mean, that is one of the other um, things about the film is you've got these stories being told about um, the, the previous times, but you've got these pictures of, for instance, in the factories where the women have the hair nets and it's sparklingly clean and it's all done, you know, and it's almost not production line, but that sort of sense that it's a modern day factory. And there's just that, you know, shift between what you're seeing again and what you're hearing. Yeah, and I mean, it was, you know, we sat down, we listened to a lot of these uh, voices and, and one of the, the key things about bringing in the, you know, the processing side of it was also to bring in the female voice as well and the, and the female perspective because they're, you know, the fishing industry covers yeah. the entire spectrum of, of life in the islands and, and, and the hearing girls were the kind of parallel to that. The hearing girls stories were brilliant and we found some amazing archive of, of the ladies talking. So they were recording in the 50s, talking about their time in the 20s getting on, you know, going to the mainland and working in the herring. And and they would go as a group of Harris girls or a group of Lewis girls or a group of Ada boys or girls. And they, that was sort of how they traveled. And, and as a result, they had brilliant stories, really, you know, really funny stuff that we, some stuff we couldn't make into the film as well. And, and but you also realized, I realized when I was, you know, filming in the, with the, with the processing, which, which are very much tied to the fishing in today's yeah. industry. So the, someone like McDuff who, who looks after one of the big processing points in Stornoway who were you know great in letting us film and but they also support a lot of the boats and fishermen and you know loans and these sort of things so they, they're very much tied together in the industry but it's also the wives of a lot of the fishermen that are there working you know they they are working go to Cullen and, and Grimsey that there's there's boats there that are going out and getting scallops and getting prawns and and it's their their partners that are in the um in the in the processing there as well and, and they have their own community and, and support each other and jokes and and, and whatever so they while while i was filming you know it all looks a bit serious 
probably it was more that the camera was there that they, they kind of they, 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 that because you know in any workplace there's more kind of what you would imagine what you have called banter or whatever than maybe yeah. you would see on thing now you, yeah. make, you you mentioned the music um and because some of the tales which are told are about lives lost and things like that and you've got this wonderful music as well there is a kind of melancholy feel to it i think yeah so it was interesting because they you know there is a lot of tragedy that has that has hit those islands and but there's a lot of fun and laughter as well so that finding that balance within the within the the archive first of all and then working with aiden to make that you know we didn't want it to be you know obviously we didn't want it to be depressing we wanted to pull people out but Oh, and, the, and especially in the last third of the film and because there's a lot of joy and laughter yeah. the, the idea of sitting around a Kaylee is both a mix of stories of tragedy but great fun and songs and, and and that side as well and that was that was almost the atmosphere we wanted to we had in our mind of you know sitting around a traditional Kaylee which is you know around a fire and and having a drink and telling stories and singing songs and and that you know that idea came up in the archive as well people were talking about th this process so you needed you needed both both sides to it and that balance is is you know that's part of the editing process i think of finding that balance and it was also required with the music so aiden um and music and almost is maybe tricky because you know Sc scott's scottish traditional music is great at being sad you know <laughs> being melancholic and it works brilliantly for it but of course finding the the joy and uh, without it being too um jiggy or or you know too just like a dance tune is, is also tricky but aiden is, was did a remarkable job really i mean this is aiden o'rourke's first score film score mm, which i was surprised so, at. i would have thought he would have been done one before but yeah yeah i mean it was part of the reason i you know i i i you know we i knew him through lao and his work there and and it is very cinematic his music mm. it's a it's a very cinematic type of folk music it suited this project very well he was always our target uh, when we, i was in development with this because it's a very in some ways he does what the film's trying to do as well he combines the past and the present with how he works works a lot with kind of loops and synthesized sounds but fun at its base is a very traditional um you know repertoire of, of sounds and, and music and we work with him uh in a way that probably wasn't that typical either that we we, we borrowed a like a, a production method a bit from from scotland with love which which mm -hmm. colin edited as well and um at rough cut stage we, we gave aiden sequences and part of the film and to watch and to respond to so he was scoring before we locked the film and so he was able to give us material we were able to respond and we were working quite collaboratively which was you know which was great and and lockdown helped it a little bit we we had this film 80 percent we were 80 percent of the edit done then lockdown happened but very weirdly we were planning to edit remotely for the last months and then lockdown happened and we were totally prepared Ac totally accidentally we were <laughs> the only film production that was but it meant that Aiden was able, he, you know, he maybe had a bit more time than he would have otherwise and and worked through this process of scoring this material. And it, and it was probably harder, I think, or more time consuming to get right because it, because there was, you know, there was how you push and pull the sound of the archive was, you know, where he would push and pull that with the music. Yeah. It was a really, really intricate discussion with, with myself, Colin and, and Aiden. And also where he played with the, with the archive, so there was moments, quite a few that that were brilliant musically. That he was accompanying the archive. You know, he he would have the archive that we were using, and he would one or two of them. You know, he would play along with the singer. The singer's been recorded in a kitchen in in you know in Bada in 1950, and he was Aiden kind of with a ten piece band, like we're playing with them. But it also meant the singers weren't professional, yeah. and they were probably dropping dropping about five keys as they went. And that, Aiden was sort of like. You know, you can always hear him swearing in his head as he had the drop key, <laughs> key, key. But they did an incredible job, and 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 I, they're musically they're some of my favourite bits because they, it's something you don't often hear, you know, on a film score where there's a real conversation between the material, the sound material, and um and the music, and and yeah, and so obviously there was, you know, there is that melancholy, and and he could really tease that out, and he could tease out drama, and he could tease out these things that we had in there, but music does really well, but. The, the joy as well and the positivity was um, came through instrumentation. I mean, he had a, a really interesting group of musicians on board. Um, Bridie Campbell was on board, who's a you know, one of the top uh, pipers it's up in Sky, and um, and and you know, pianist, uh, jazz guitarist, 
you know, not necessarily a typical harmonium player. He had a bass sax on there at one point, he had chalice and all sorts of things. And, and it made for a, you know, but underneath it was his fiddle, like his fiddle yeah. kind of leads, leads the score, but it, it, it let him kind of, uh, you know, bring out some of these other tones and especially the, the, the fun and joy because it was, it's tough. It, it was maybe the biggest challenge musically for him to do that. To, to... Yeah, the music's fantastic. I mean... No, it's, it's coming out as an album as well. So Aiden's going to release that, uh, which, which, which is great. And I think it'll stand really nicely uh, as an album. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I listen to a lot of soundtrack stuff, and I think it's, he's going to do it a bit later, hopefully, when we have some physical releases in these events. You know, the goal for the, goal for the film is also to have live, some live events oh, yeah. um, with a full band, because again, you know, there's been, it's been done a wee bit, but it, it creates a really unique uh, kind of event. And I think it would, for this film, lend itself very well to that. And, but that's, autumn if we're lucky <laughs> no who knows that would be amazing that would be absolutely amazing i was actually interested in the other technical uh, aspects of shooting the film because you see you had someone who was an underwater photographer and you're using drones but just filming on a working boat must have been challenging <laughs> yeah that was all me so that, that was me by myself generally some of the creoles was another block there was a um i, I had i had another assistant and a, and a researcher with me but the majority of it was me and yeah, it was. I mean, I tend to throw myself into quite odd positions. I, you know, I, 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 I start projects and say I never want to shoot them myself. I always want a cinematographer, and then I end up filming them partly because it costs a lot, and partly because the projects evolve into places that that no one else will come. Um, but you know, but but there's a, you know there's a real benefit of being a one man crew because you can get move around, you can be you know I, I, you can test things a lot more. But it was very hard, and and you know my editor will be the first one to say how much you know how how many ruined shots I had because of you just you just toppling over on these boats and you're holding on and you, you life jacket up and and you've, you've got to try and shoot what are very dramatic moments um but you've also got to keep on board and and not fall off because it, obviously it's dangerous and obviously you have insurance but you really don't want to use it so I don't yeah I never fully told my wife probably how uh, until she saw the film what some of the circumstances were but they they were good the fishermen were great they knew what was going on most of the time, they just wanted me to, you know, see how seasick I get, and um, and they they had a good laugh when, when when I when it all got a bit much, and I had a few over the side. But they, <laughs> but they, yeah, it's it was about in, in some ways spending the day. So I go out with the trawlers. I mean, the trawlers are really generous with their time, and they normally they'll go out for ten days straight. You know, they would just leave yeah. and stay on board, and it was you know eat, trawl, sleep, um, and, and that's on rotate, and it's a really tough kind of process. So obviously I. Um, couldn't go up for 10 days so I'd sort of go for you know a 24 hour period or so and they would, would come in and out of Stornoway and I'd sort of steam me in and out and and that was brilliant and mm -hmm. um, but it did mean that yeah you were you were you were definitely for that 24 hours in, in their cycle and you didn't really I don't know better anything so I was sort of <laughs> catch a catch a bit of shut eye in the cabin but but you got all, all sides to it and the creel the creel working again they start early it's it's always mm -hmm. six o'clock get up and and they're, and they're obviously working with the weather. The amount of trips that I had out there, I mean, maybe I think I made about eight trips, eight filming trips, I think. But um, why, they would get delayed. There'd be storms coming in. And ironically, we got to the end of the footage. Actually, one of the problems with the footage, when I got about 80% shot, it was all too nice. They were like, we need some storms. Like, we, <laughs> there isn't a, it looks too pleasant. It looks like the Caribbean. So I did have to go back in winter a few times to try and get that. And, and it, yeah, it's the mist. And then... But of course, the, the irony is that if it was too if it was too yeah, stormy, yeah. I couldn't go out because it was they weren't going out. So you sort of had to find a balance. But um, I think we captured it enough, and I, I think there was a there was a sense of you know that those seasons as well because they do really affect the, the time. But obviously, summer's beautiful up there, and, and um, as it is, you know, it never rains or anything. But they, but they, but the winters it got its own charm, and I think that that was that was interesting for me. And I've spent Hogmanays up there, and and it's it's beautiful as well, and and, and its own very you know maybe it's a bit more melancholic, but it's the, the mist and the 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 sea and things make make for something quite incredible. And at the very end, as the over the closing credits, you've these lovely black and white uh, pictures. Um, I presume taken at the time from when they were referring to and when the people the people were talking yeah about. Did you yeah so so they they're from a, a bunch of sources that was really that was always the intention to kind of bring the you know bring an audience back to putting a face to these voices yeah. so at the end and it would sort of bring everything home a little bit and the song 
at the end is you know a really powerful rendition of, of Fedavata that was sung by Nan McKinnon, who's one of about to say um, you know a big contributor from about to say who was you know that was a that's a version of Fedavata that no one really heard before. It was a, it was a specific Bata version that no one had knew, and even our song consultants didn't hadn't really heard that version. So it was you know it, it made for a big ending. We wanted a we wanted a, a fairly big emotional ending because this sort of film where it's a portrait, you need obviously need a big start and ending, but to leave an audience with a you know a sense that of 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 completion, a little bit of understanding, and putting a face to those voices. And so the images were um, a lot from the the Museum of Scotland were really great with with helping us here. The the archive itself, so the School of Scottish Studies, who you know obviously fundamental to making this happen, that they've done this work for, really for the fifteen years before now of digitalizing this archive. At the same time, they also have a really remarkable uh, photographic archive that they've had work contributed and a lot of that was sort of a lot more anthropological so not necessarily professional photographs but um but capturing just the everyday and and that was what we had to go for but it was the faces that we wanted to show of the people like you said that were talking the, the faces the voices and it was a fun process to be honest the, the photos because you there's just there's some incredible work that's been done and, and a lot of it was wasn't professional but they they captured moments that were that would link to the the stories. I mean, it was it was strange sometimes that you would sort of find a photo that would that you could put the story. I could have just put that story on that photo and just let the story play because because it was it was so close to what they were talking about. Um, be it sort of dealing with creoles or dealing with uh, you know drunken drunken sailor drunken drunken colleagues on the boat these sort of things. And are you working on anything next or is it all about Yoram at the moment? Is it all about taking it round, or not taking it round festivals, but showing it at festivals, I should say? Yeah, I mean, you're always kind of, I think as a filmmaker, you try and keep moving. I mean, I've, I've, my previous feature was sort of four years ago before this, and that's, you know, that distance for a filmmaker, for creative docs, does take a long time. I mean, you know, I'm an academic filmmaker, so I'm a lecturer at Newcastle University as well, and my films sit within this kind of, you know, I get a lot of support from academic worlds, but it means we do, you know, also quite a lot of impact work and we want the films to, we want the films not just to be entertainment, to also engage. So we have a lot of plans with this film and, and, and its relay, release. Um, but I am, I am working on a couple of films, you know, I, I, gonna, I have made films about language for the last few films. That's, that's my interest in, in research area. I think language and society is a really interesting uh, field that documentary film can explore in an interesting mm -hmm. way. And, and there's a lot of subjects, you know, uh, that are you know, politically impactful and pertinent. But we can, we can, there's there's ways that creative documentary can explore them. So there's a there, there's a, a bit of a possible follow up to this that's actually from a sound archive in New Zealand. Um, so we're obviously where I'm from originally. I've been in Scotland 15 years, but um, I've been looking at a possible project there that would that would develop a bit of what we've discovered in this film because we, you know, like I said, it was a creative experiment. And you know we think it worked, and and it's something that I would like to develop a bit more, um, and yeah, and, and and some other features that were in development that we can hopefully move a bit faster. Uh, now that it's a good it's a good moment to be in development on a film because you can't film anywhere anyway. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so working in sound archive and these things is a helpful moment, and we're all hoping next year that you know things will open up. But I mean, in saying that, the release of this you mentioned the, the Glasgow Film Festival. The you know the, this is we're having a a, a theatrical release on the 5th of March, the film will be available in cinemas across the UK and it's at home cinemas. It's on their, yeah. you know, cinema right at home systems, you know, and there's 30 or 40 cinemas that are taking it. And it's not the same as we want it to go on a physical cinema. Obviously right now, this conversation around Scottish fishing yeah. is pertinent. It's, it's, there is a risk to what's going on. The, the fishermen in the film themselves are in touch with a lot. It's been a heck of a tough year for them. They don't know whether they're going to hold on. And with them, like the film points out, you know, come the fishing and with the fishing industry comes the Gaelic language and the thousands of years of culture. And, and so I think we want the film to enter into that conversation, especially over the next few months and uh, and to be used as people want it to be used and to, for it to travel. And, and for, you know, we think that, we think it it, high, it speaks also to, you know, places, places like Brittany, Basque country, Sicily, there's, there's, there's communities there that, there is a real tie to what the film highlights, we think. So um, it'll be interesting if we if we get some audiences more internationally for this film and, and hopefully we do and hopefully it 
you know, not only paints, you know, gives people an insight into the Hebrides and, and, and the Gaelic language, but gives them a chance to think about their own, you know, local language context and, and where and how we, how we look after storytelling and, and oral history, because it's there. There's a, there's a lot of these archives around the world that I think have been a little bit overlooked and mm -hmm. a lot of them are getting digitalized now. And there is an incredible repository of, of memory and history. And, and even this archive, and it's, it's a good place to end that, you know, the archive at the heart of this film is, it's, you can explore a lot of it on a website called Tobit and Dockers or Kits of Riches, which is the School of Scottish Studies archive. But that itself is, is sort of developing into a bigger Scottish uh, Scotland sound archive project at the moment which is important, you know, we do it with Visual Archive a lot, but I think there's a, somewhere like Scotland, which is a country of storytellers, there's a, um, there's a, there's a real wealth in, in, in these archives. Well, I thought it was a fantastic film and I really can't wait for other people to see it. But uh, Alistair, thank you so much for talking to me today. Brilliant, all right. Well, thank you very much, Ali, as well, and, and all the best. And we'll be back soon with someone completely different. Mm -hmm.